Amen. Amen. Brother Hoggerbrooks, that was exciting. Thank you so much. I love hearing your voice. Well, it is my great pleasure and honor to introduce someone that I have had an enormous amount of respect since I was itsy bitsy. In fact, this individual inspired me to become a physician many, many years ago. It's Dr. Benjamin Carson. I remember. <laughs> I remember as a child listening to Dr. Carson at various camp meetings and thinking, oh, if I could only become a physician one day, I would hope to follow in his amazing, amazing footprints. Dr. Carson Sr., Dr. Benjamin Carson Sr., is a retired neurosurgeon and a politician who served as the 17th United States Secretary of the Housing and Urban Development from 2017 to 2021. He was a leading uh, Republican presidential candidate as well in 2016. And most importantly, Dr. Benjamin Carson is an amazing Christian physician who stands for liberty of conscience and believes that each and every one of us has the right to follow the dictates of our own conscience in following what God would have us to do with our lives. I am so excited to listen to what Dr. Benjamin Carson has to share with us today. Thank you. God so loved the world. Any of that coming through? All right, let's try this. You're okay. Can the audience hear? Okay. All right, very good. The audience can hear, so don't worry about it. <laughs> All right. Well, you know, I am so thrilled to be here today, and uh, I will take issue with one thing that Dr. Lewis said. She described me as a politician. Uh, I'm not a politician. I did work in the political arena, but definitely not a politician, because politicians do things that are politically expedient, and I don't want to go in that direction. Um, but, uh, you know, I've had a little bit of trouble retiring. Uh, I was going to retire uh, when I finished my neurosurgical career and uh, enjoy life and play golf and learn how to play the organ. And it was going to be really wonderful. Uh, but I failed that retirement. And I ended up in, uh, in Washington, D.C. And then after the election last November, I said, uh, now I can retire. But uh, as you see, I did not retire because uh, I and uh, several other people had, had realized that the country was moving in the wrong direction. And uh, are you still hearing me okay? Okay. Uh, that's why we decided to create the American Cornerstone Institute, uh, a think tank slash do tank based on the pillars, the four pillars uh, that allowed this country to move from a bunch of ragtag militiamen to the pinnacle of the world in record time. And those four pillars are our faith, liberty, community, and life. 
And I want to concentrate on that second pillar, liberty. This is what has made the United States of America the destination for people all across the globe. They want to be in a place where their personal freedom is valued. And in the beginning, so many people came to this country from overseas because they were in societies with monarchs, with kings, with people who were always making mandates and telling them what they could do and what they couldn't do and where they could go and why they had to do this and that and the other. And uh, this was a country that was gonna be free of that. And even today, people still are trying to get into this country, even though there are those who say that it is a systemically racist country and full of horrible intentions. Uh, if we were so horrible, why would people be forming caravans trying to get in here? Um, so, you know, at some point you have to just open your eyes and, uh, and look around you and see what's going on uh, rather than listening to people who are still trying to manipulate people. But early on, when the pilgrims came to this country, they dedicated this country to God and to our Judeo-Christian values and principles. Those are the things that taught us how to relate to our fellow man. Love your neighbor. What happens when those Christian values depart from us? Something else comes in, something that is not pure, something that is not righteous. And it starts saying to you, cancel your neighbor. If they don't agree with you, make their lives difficult, make their families' lives difficult. Obviously, that is not anything good that is creating those kinds of feelings among our people. But remember, the human heart is desperately wicked and deceitful, it tells us in Jeremiah. And it is only the cleansing power of God and that relationship that changes us, makes us into the right kinds of people, because people are people. And uh, no matter where they are, any part of the world, you know, when they get an advantage, uh, they do things that aren't necessarily good things unless they are motivated by higher spirituality. And uh, governments are the same way. You know, there are those who think that uh, our government is pure and righteous. Uh, no government is pure and righteous, quite frankly, uh, because they are occupied by people. And governments do what governments do, just like lions do what lions do. Lions aren't evil creatures, but they kill gazelles and they eat them. Why? Because they're lions, that's what lions do. That's what governments do. They grow, enlarge, infiltrate, and dominate. And that's the very reason that God inspired those who wrote our Constitution to create a document that would give the people a tool to constrain the government. And, uh, you know, those arguments are going on right now in the Supreme Court of our nation, looking at whether the people will continue to be the central focus or whether the government becomes the central focus of this country. And, um, you know, throughout history, there have been people like Marxists who will come into a, a relatively stable environment and change it into something that is unrecognizable. They usually start by identifying a group of people within that society. And they say that these are the people who are causing all of our problems. And if we can just change them or get rid of them, everything will be just fine. Does that sound in any way familiar to anything that's going on today? And, um, at first, you just sort of demonize them, you talk about them, and then you begin to put restrictions on them. And then you begin to punish them 
And then it goes on and on. You can imagine where that ends up and where it has ended up with Marxist governments around the world. And then we also have to recognize that as a Judeo-Christian nation in terms of our foundations, we have to be willing to speak up for those who cannot speak up for themselves. That includes little babies in their mother's womb. Think about the fact that in this nation, we have allowed the murder of 60 million babies. How can God bless a nation like that? And it's time really for us to repent and make amends for that. I think about what it looks like, what an abortion looks like. I don't know if you've ever seen one before, but uh, you can see it on the screen, on the ultrasonic screen. Little baby, you can see the arms and the legs and the little fingers and toes and the face with the little nose and the heart beating. And then a tube is introduced. And sometimes the baby moves away from it before it tears off an arm and a leg and eventually sucks up the whole baby. And there are people who are horrified by that and horrified by the whole concept of using parts of little babies for medical experimentation and to create other therapies. And they have true religious convictions that find that abhorrent. Our government is now telling many of them that we don't care about your religious convictions. Think about that and think about the implications of what that means. And it's time for us to really start thinking about returning this nation to God. You know, you look at every coin in your pocket, every bill in your wallet that says, in God we trust. Our very Pledge of Allegiance says, we're one nation under God. Our founding document, the Declaration of Independence, talks about certain unalienable rights given to us by our creator, aka God. And yet, what are we doing with God's word? And it's time for that transformation. It's been time for a long time, but we've gone further and further away, even at the time of George Washington. Congress at that time said we should have a national day of prayer and reconciliation. Abraham Lincoln, the same thing. We've had it a few times in this country. We may very well need it right now. But we need more than just lip service. We need people to do things. You know, when I think about George Washington, what an amazing individual he was. And he prayed often. He had a true relationship with God. You know, he was known as the bulletproof president. And uh, the story used to appear in American history books. During the French and Indian War, he was a courier uh, for General Braddock. Back and forth, all the carriers would go. They were all shot dead. And Washington's horse was shot from under him. And he had four bullet holes in his coat and bullet fragments in his hair, but no harm to him. And uh, many years later, uh, he was in the area where that war had taken place. And one of the Indian chiefs, who was very old by that time, and close to death, said, please take me to see this man. And they brought him to George Washington. This was before he became president, but he was quite popular. And the old Indian chief said, sir, I just had to meet you. Because you see, during the French and Indian War, I was firing at you. And I am an expert marksman. And I shot you many times. And my men shot you many times. And after a while, I told them, just stop shooting you because they were wasting their bullets. And I wanted to meet the man who was protected by the great spirit above. Can you believe that it used to be in American history books? 
And then they decided it was politically incorrect. What a bunch of garbage. It was very correct. And it's, you know, you think about some of the things that have happened with our country. How was a ragtag bunch of militiamen able to defeat the most powerful military force on earth other than the intervention of God? It would be like Cuba defeating the United States, which, well, I won't go there. But at, at any rate, um, the Battle of Long Island, again, George Washington, his last real big fight because uh, General Howe had him surrounded by land and sea. And it looked like they were gonna be able to wipe out the last regiment and capture George Washington. And of course he would have been hung. Well, that night, a dense fog fell over the area and it remained after the sunrise and Washington was able to ferry all of his people to safety. Now the meteorological records are still intact from back then and it shows that that did occur. That's not a myth. And some people say it's just a coincidence. I don't think it's a coincidence. It shows that God is in our lives. And if we examine our lives carefully, we will find that he is there. He doesn't force himself upon us. And sometimes we just have to stop and listen to that still small silent voice look at things that happened in our lives. I remember uh, once there was a case of a young man. Uh, he had a disease called von Hippel Lindau, and they developed tumors, these very vascular tumors in parts of the brain. Well, he unfortunately developed one in the middle of his brain stem. This is an inoperable area. And uh, none of the neurosurgeons would touch him. Uh, and it turns out, unfortunately for me, that his wife was a nurse on the pediatric neurosurgery service. So she said, you're gonna have to operate on my husband. And I said, but he's an adult, I'm a pediatric neurosurgeon. And she says, he acts like a child. Well, yeah, I could not get away from her. I had, to, I had to think about it. And she said, just go talk to him. And I, I, I went and talked to him and I said, you know, uh, this is in a very delicate area. It's considered inoperable. And if I try to operate on you, there's at least a 50-50 chance that you will die on the table. And he said, Doc, if you don't operate, there's a 100% chance I'm going to die. I'll take 50-50 any day. I said, that sounds pretty mature. Well, in the operating room, uh, it was very difficult. He had grown a lot of new vasculature to try to feed the tumor. We got through all that down to his pawns and I made a small, small incision under the high magnification of the microscope. And I, I couldn't open up a hole big enough to see because it would destroy too much neural tissue. So I used a probe and I, moved it in the direction where I felt the tumor would be. And I felt a different consistency and I assumed that was the tumor and used a little micro forcep, grabbed the edge of it and started delivering it. And the evoked potentials went flat. These are the little electrical waves that show the neural activity went flat. And the anesthesiologist said, see, I told you, you were gonna kill him, he's dead you may as well stop. But I finished taking the tumor out, closed them up. He went back to the ICU on maximum life support. Of course, I was a little disappointed. I was a lot disappointed. But the next morning when I came in, he was sitting up in the bed cracking jokes and he did just fine. You know what that told me? It told me that you may be a pretty terrific surgeon, but uh, you're not doing all this stuff. This is something that God does. God is in our lives. We have to be willing to acknowledge that. He wants to save us. He wants to save this country. He loves this country, but we have to stop turning our back on him. And we have to have courage to stand up for those things that are true, 
those things that are correct in our lives. Where does that courage come from? I remember again, uh, a time when I was a, a resident and uh, I was on call. It was the time of a national neurosurgical meeting. So almost all the attendings were away in another part of the country. They had left one behind to take care of emergencies. And uh, that night, a young man was brought in who had been severely beaten with a baseball bat. He was unconscious. Uh, and the CAT scan showed that his brain was swelling. Uh, he had hemorrhages. Uh, he was clearly going to die unless a dramatic operation was done to remove part of his frontal lobe and part of his temporal lobe. And uh, that was an operation I'd never done before. Plus, I couldn't do that operation anyway. I was a resident. You had to have an attending. Uh, so we tried to reach the attending. I couldn't reach him. The nurses couldn't reach him. The paging operators couldn't reach him. And the young man was dying. And I was in a real dilemma there. You know, it was unlawful for me to take him to the operating room. That would certainly be putting my career at risk. And yet he could die if I didn't. And I had never done that operation before I'd seen it. And I prayed and I said, Lord, please tell me, show me what to do. And after that prayer, I felt so calm. I said, of course, I'm going to take him to the operating room. And everything was crystal clear to me. I remembered everything that had to be done. The operation was successful. And that young man today is a child psychologist doing things for other people. But, um, you know, I didn't get in any trouble. In fact, I was praised for having the courage to do the right thing. That courage came from God. And that's where we need to get our courage from right now. It's so important. And, uh, you know, there, there's an argument about follow the science. What's the science? I'll tell you, real science is very congruent with logic and common sense. And those are the things that are very congruent with God. And, uh, you know, we see a lot of stuff going on. It doesn't make any sense, like, ignoring natural immunity. Boy, that doesn't make any sense at all. We've known about natural immunity since the Civil War and smallpox. And uh, it has been very effective. So why won't they acknowledge it now? Because tens of millions of people have it, maybe up to 100 million Americans have it. And if you have natural immunity, you don't need a vaccine. So you can't acknowledge it because then you can't go around saying everybody has to have a vaccine. Uh, you know, think about that. And we have the best medical system in the world. We have very well-trained healthcare professionals. Why don't we just let people work with their healthcare professionals who know their history uh, and can work very effectively with them? One size does not fit all. And, uh, you know, certainly older people who have a lot of comorbidities, uh, they probably benefit tremendously uh, from being vaccinated. Uh, young people or children who are perfectly healthy, you know, their chances of mortality from this is 0 0.02. Uh, that's very, very, very small. And uh, yet, yeah, we have no idea what the long-term risk of the vaccine are. This is mRNA technology. This is new technology. We don't know what the impact of this is 20 years from now or 30 years from now. It doesn't matter that much for the old people. It matters a whole lot for the very young. And if you do an analysis, what's the best thing that can happen if we do this? What's the worst thing that can happen if we do it? What's the best thing that happens if we don't do it? What's the worst thing that happens if we don't do it? Well, think about it. You take a young, healthy child and you give him the vaccine. The best thing that happens is he gets a little more immunity. He already has pretty good immunity already, but he gets maybe a little bit more. The worst thing that happens, you know, he develops severe autoimmune 
phenomenon that affects the function of organs down the line. And you have this holding this over his head for decades. Uh, you know, the two don't seem very uh, equal to me in terms of risk. So, you know, we just have to start thinking about these things. And uh, we have to be the people who stand up for it. You know, the people who save our government, who save our nation, it's not going to be the government. Uh, like I told you, governments are governments. I don't care if they're Republican or Democrat, it doesn't matter. They, that's what they do, they control. And uh, this country is supposed to be about the people, of, by, and for the people, not of, by, and for the government. But the only way it happens is if the people stand up. And that's, that's what we're going to be called to do. I think that's what God calls us to do. And let's stand up for freedom. Freedom of people to work with their health care providers. Freedom for people to work with natural remedies. Uh, freedom to pursue therapeutics. Therapeutics saved me when I caught uh, COVID. And uh, I got the monoclonal antibodies before they were approved. And uh, it saved my life. Uh, we, we need to be looking at these uh, therapeutics. And knowing that lifestyle does make a difference. Now, one of the first things that medical students are taught is that there are two groups of people uh, in America who live seven to 10 years longer than the rest of the population. Seventh-day Adventists and Mormons. That's because of lifestyle. Lifestyle does make a difference. And before I close, I just want people to know that, again, the thing that is going to save our nation, the thing that is going to preserve freedom for your children and your grandchildren is us. It's our turn. You know, think about the people who came before us and what they were willing to sacrifice. Think about World War II and D-Day and those young boys, in many cases, only 17 or 18 years old, going onto the shores of Normandy, being mowed down by machine gun fire. Hundreds lying dead in the sand, A thousand bodies laying there. Were the others frightened? Did they turn back? Yes, they were frightened, but they didn't turn back. They stepped over those bodies and they overwhelmed the Axis forces, knowing in many cases that they would never see their loved ones or their homeland again. Why did they do it? They didn't do it for themselves. They did it for us. They did it for you, they did it for me so that we could live in freedom. And the question is, what are we willing to do so that those who come after us can live in freedom? Will you suffer some persecution? You might. You know, 2 Timothy 3.12 says, those who live in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Yeah, they'll come after you. But you know what? A little tribulation here against the backdrop of eternity doesn't mean very much. And the next time you're singing our national anthem and you get to the end of that first stanza and it says the land of the free and the home of the brave, don't let those words just roll off your lips. Think about what they mean because you cannot be the land of the free if you're not the home of the brave. God bless you all. Thank you. Well, with me, I have a few friends of mine, Stephanie Saban, a nurse, and good friend